It's good to have you with us this morning. We are uh, in Matthew 25, talking about uh, it's the last section of the Olivet Discourse. Chapters 24 and 25 are speaking of all kinds of last days things. Jesus answered questions from the disciples about, you know, when will the temple be destroyed? Well, that was 70 AD. You know, when will these increases in earthquakes and pestilences and famines and wars and rumors of wars? And Jesus says, these are just birth pangs, the things we've been seeing. And it'll culminate with the great tribulation. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that takes you three and a half years into the great tribulation. So he speaks a lot about these last days, even further into the future from our perspective. Not too far down the road, Lord willing, but it's amazing the things that we've been seeing here in these two chapters. So um, this morning we'll look at separating the sheep from the goats, and this is speaking of the second coming of Christ. So let's open up in a word of prayer and get rid of John's mic. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day where we can just gather together to worship you, to spend time in your word, just to remember all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. Lord, we thank you that though the outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Lord, we thank you that your word builds us up and strengthens us. We thank you, Lord, that um, we're about to see you face to face. And it could be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the rapture, or it could be sooner as individual believers just go home to be with you. So I just pray that we would be watching and ready and living our lives for your glory till that day you call us home to be with you. So we just commit this time to you now, Lord, and pray that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying and give us wisdom and discernment as we go through your living word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we come to the last section of the Olivet Discourse. Again, this will speak of what Jesus will do at his second coming. He'll bring an end to the Great Tribulation. Uh, we saw that the Great Tribulation is a brutal time. It's seven years where God's wrath is being poured out. And you can read about it in Revelation 6 through 18. It goes into the great detail about the Great Tribulation. Demons are let loose, and they're going all around just, you know, destroying people. Um, Battle of Armageddon will be taking place just as Jesus is coming back at his second coming. He'll bring it to an end because Jesus said uh, back in chapter 24, verse 22, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. The word saved means rescued or delivered. It's going to be the most horrible time of judgment this world has ever seen. And the only reason it's shortened is with the second coming of Christ from heaven to earth. We'll pick up in verse 31 here in a moment. And he'll describe what immediately takes place when he returns. This is when Jesus will separate his people, and he'll refer to him as the sheep, from the goats. And in context here, he's talking about those during the Great Tribulation who receive the mark of the beast, who reject God's plan of salvation for their lives. And so um, we're going to see that when he returns, um, part of the sheep are the Jews that get saved. When Jesus returns, they're going to heed his warnings. Remember when we saw Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, flee, get out of Jerusalem. Pray your flight is not on the Sabbath. It's all about the Jews getting out of Israel because the Antichrist is going to go on the rampage at that moment. So what Jesus speaks of now is often referred to as the judgment of the nation. Some of you might have that as a title in your Bible over this section. Uh, as we'll see, the sheep will enter into the millennial reign of Christ. In other words, they will enter into that thousand-year reign when Jesus sets up his kingdom, and those that make it through the Great Tribulation will go into that in their natural human bodies. We are going to be in our resurrection bodies because he's coming for the bride before the tribulation. He's going to rapture us out of here. We're going to come back with him at his second coming. On the other hand, the goats will be cast into everlasting punishment, of which uh, the final sentencing day will be at the great white throne, and they will you know, be sentenced to the lake of fire. Here in Matthew 25, we're given some insights into what Jesus does when he returns at his second coming. 
So again, Matthew 24, 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. And that act by the Antichrist takes place right in the middle of that seven-year great tribulation period. Um, he'll go into the rebuilt temple that he's going to allow the Jews to build, he goes into that temple, and Paul says he goes into that temple, and he'll say, I am God, worship me. That's the abomination of desolation. From that point, you can count. We, we don't need to count it. We'll be up in heaven with the Lord. But people can count 1,260 days, and that'll be when Jesus returns at his second coming. We looked at uh, in detail when he says, nobody knows the day or the hour. That's referring to the rapture of the church. Because that could happen today, it could happen next year, we don't know when. It could happen at any moment. But we know 1,260 days from the abomination of desolation, Jesus will return. In Revelation, it gives us that number. In Revelation, it says 42 months. That's three and a half years. In Revelation, it says time times and half a time. Again, three and a half years. At the very end of the book of Daniel... We're given a couple more numbers of days. Look at these verses. Daniel chapter 12, verses 11 and 12 says, From the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, that's when the Antichrist goes into the temple, there shall be 1,290 days. 30 days are added there. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. And so... There's When Jesus returns and sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives, there's a 75-day period that, that we'll, hopefully we'll see some of the things that he does during these 75 days that Daniel refers to. Um, when you start putting the pieces of the scriptures together, it speaks of the Lord's return, and then you have a thousand-year reign. And there's three major events that take place when he first comes back from heaven to earth. First thing he's going to do is gather all the Jews who've been scattered back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. We saw in Matthew 24, verse 31, he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And twice he uses the word elect there, and it's referring to the Jewish people, not the bride of Christ. This will lead to, to the scenario in Matthew 25, where Jesus separates the sheep from the goats, his people from the unbelievers. And then Jesus will start restoring during the 75-day 75 75 period, he'll start restoring the earth. Remember that during the Great Tribulation, you go through these judgments. Half of the world's population is going to be wiped out. Towards the end of the Tribulation, we're told that every sea creature in all the oceans of the world die. It's going to stink. It's going to be nasty. Every tree in the world, all the green grass in the world is going to be burned up. This world's on the brink of annihilation, but that's when Jesus returns. And so part, you know, the second thing he does, he brings the Jews back, and then he restores planet Earth because he's going to turn this world that is so devastated. You've got Armageddon, you've got God's wrath, you've got the demons running loose, and, and he's going to restore it, and it's going to be like one giant garden of Eden throughout the world. Isaiah speaks a lot about this. Uh, in fact, in Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, it says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be uh, given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. And, and he goes on to talk about the waters bursting forth, uh, forth in the deserts, and he's going to have streams in the deserts. Uh, he's going to open up the ears of the deaf, the eyes of the blind. He, he's going to um, just bring peace on earth for a thousand years. That's when you read about the lion lying down with the lamb and the wolf lying down with the lamb, the child playing by the cobra's hole and nobody's going to be hurt. It's just peace and righteousness during this time. So the millennial reign of Christ will be glorious. It'll be a time of peace, prosperity, safety, 
and worship because the whole world's going to recognize Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Savior. And He is going to rule for a thousand years in goodness and grace and mercy and righteousness. And then that brings us to the third major event that takes place when Jesus returns. His feet step down on the Mount of Olives. The Bible is very clear about that in Zechariah. He will cause the mountain to split in two. He will go up on the Temple Mount. And I think one of the first things he does then is he's going to wipe out that temple that the Antichrist allowed the Jews to build. I think when they're going to build, it's not on the actual place where the original temple was supposed to be built. The reason I say that is because when you look at Ezekiel 40 through 48, it goes into great detail about this millennial temple that will be built. The Lord will rule and reign from this temple in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. It's going to be much more glorious than any temple, better than Solomon's, Herod's, the Antichrist, certainly, I think because of the desolation, uh, the abomination, he's going to wipe that out, build this new temple. And, it's, uh, and Ezekiel talks about rivers flowing from there to the east and the west. It'll go west of the Mediterranean Sea. It'll go east, this river, down to the Dead Sea, and it'll bring the Dead Sea back to life. And so this is all going to happen, these three things, when Christ returns. So I think that's what these 75 days represent. I could be wrong, but... We'll find out when we get there, right? So, Jesus is coming back in power and great glory. And what are we going to be doing? We're coming back with the Lord. Well, it says there in um, Revelation 19, 15, that we'll be clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, which is the righteous acts of the saints. We're coming back with him. Jesus is on a white horse. It says we're on white horses following him at his second coming. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago where he says to those who were faithful with what he entrusted to them as believers, I will give you, you know, charge over cities and different places in the world. And so we're going to be enforcing righteousness. We'll be in our resurrection bodies during this millennial reign of Christ. We will be keeping righteous order on planet Earth. So again, a few things to think about as we go through this when Jesus returns. And um, look at verse 31 here in chapter 25. It says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. So he summarizes all this in these two verses. He returns. He establishes his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign as the king of kings, the lord of lords, and he separates the sheep from the goats. Verse 33, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before or from the foundation of the world. He mentions the goats here. Now, there are going to be millions of unsaved people that reject Jesus Christ during the great tribulation time. They're going to be one, the ones that follow the Antichrist. They'll be the ones that take the mark of the beast upon themselves and either on their right hand or forehead they'll be guilty of persecuting and executing the believers that come to christ during the great tribulation time they'll also be guilty of cooperating with the antichrist as he tries to destroy the jewish people when they realize because jesus has given them the warning when you see the abomination of desolation get out of town and so they're going to flee. Many will end up in the wilderness. The sheep Jesus mentions here are the Gentiles who refuse to take the mark of the beast. They also have turned to Christ. They get saved. And as long as they were alive, those that aren't put to death by the Antichrist, they will be helping to um, rescue the Jews, protect the Jews during this time. The sheep will be the Gentiles who will enter into the millennial reign of Christ. As I mentioned earlier, all those that survive the Great Tribulation will go into the millennium in their natural bodies. They don't get a resurrection body until after it's all said and done. 
So the children born to these sheep, these saints, during the millennium, they'll need to be saved. As so often is the case, even though the Lord will be pouring out tremendous blessings uh, upon all the people during the time of the millennial reign of Christ, the weird thing to think about is that millions of people during the millennium will turn against Jesus. They will reject him. And they will line up with Satan, who has been locked away for a thousand years. Again, the millennial reign of Christ will be just like the Garden of Eden. There will be abundance of joy, abundance of peace, safety, righteousness, God's love poured out. And yet countless numbers of people will join forces with Satan. Where's Satan during the millennial reign of Christ? He's been locked away in the bottomless pit, the abyss for 1,000 years. That's one of the very first things we see in, in Revelation chapter 20. The Antichrist, the false prophet, get thrown into the lake of fire, but then Satan is locked away with his angel, seals him in the bottomless pit. It says for 1,000 years. Now the 1,000 years have expired. Satan will be released from his prison, and he will go throughout the nations of the world and he, in a short time, you don't need to put that up yet, he will go in a short time and he will deceive millions of people. They're going to follow him. And it's going to be crazy at this time. Okay, look at these verses. They can put it up now. It's in Revelation 20, starting in verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, will go out to deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, this is a different battle than the one during chapter 16, the Battle of Armageddon. But he'll gather these nations together to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. So again, this is the end of the thousand-year reign. Satan is let loose. He gets millions of people to follow his lies. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. That's Jerusalem. And then the next sentence is the entire battle. This is it. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Pretty simple. God's not messing around. It's not some long, drawn-out battle like we see constantly where 20 years in Vietnam and 20 years in Afghanistan, 20 years here and there. No, God's going to do it very, very quickly. And then it says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the false prophet are, and they've been there for a thousand years, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so even though the earth and its environment it has been you know, almost perfect, just like the Garden of Eden, mankind will demonstrate the truth of Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, where it says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And so, the sinful heart of human beings, it'll be on full display. Even after a thousand years of Jesus ruling and reigning in our midst, We'll be in our resurrection bodies. This isn't going to affect us. But those that go through and repopulate the earth for a thousand years, many are going to rebel against the Lord. This is also why I believe that God in His sovereignty created each one of us with a free will. He has laid out before us life and death. You can choose. He's given us heaven or hell. You can choose to follow Jesus or Satan. Very simple. He gives us forgiveness, or you can stay in rebellion. You would think the choice would be obvious, but with the combination of sinful hearts, Satan's lies, and the lusts of the world, you know, it's a miracle that any of us are saved, but it's just crazy to me to think how many are going to turn against the Lord, even during the millennium. I mean, we think... Well, if I was alive when Jesus was on planet Earth 2,000 years ago, and I was one of the guys following him around for three and a half years, I would never deny him. Uh, cock a doodle do. Remember Peter? We'll look at that in a couple of weeks. But I love the conviction, the faithfulness, the steadfastness of Joshua. I, I've been reading through Joshua, my morning devotions, and you know one of my favorite sections, Joshua, at the end of his life. I mean, he is 
an old man, 110 years old. He didn't start conquering when, until he was 80. And he goes in and he starts conquering the land, the promised land, and now it's the end of his life. And this is what we read in Joshua 24, verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. This is what he's telling all the people. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods, the idols, which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt, and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." You know, the amazing thing is if Joshua could live his life in full submission, full obedience to the Lord back then, we are without excuse. As the body of Christ, we're without excuse. He didn't have the completed canon of Scripture. We've got Genesis to Revelation. He wasn't sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise like we are. He didn't have Jesus dwelling in his heart like we do. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come and go, but he was so determined to live for God. He was not going to give in to the ways, the culture, the things of this world. And so we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. God has equipped you and I to live a life that brings glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us victory over the things of this world. And we can stand in that victory over the world, over the flesh, over Satan's lies. And like Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, he's got that long section, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And in Romans 8, 37, Paul says, And yet in all these things that try to come against us, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so again, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of, my, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now look at verse 35. Jesus continues, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren... You did it to me. Now, again, we use these verses to do a lot of great things. Ministry in prisons, ministry to the homeless, ministry in a lot of different ways. And that's great, but that's not the context of these verses. The context here is Jesus separating the sheep from the goats. This is when he comes back at his second coming. He brings an end to the great tribulation. It's these Gentile sheep who are asking Jesus, when did we see you thirsty and hungry? And when did we take you in and clothe you? When did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? Verse 40 is the answer he gives them. And as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Who is my brethren he's referring to? In context, it's the Jewish people that they were protecting during the Great Tribulation time. It's in this context. The Gentiles who got saved during the Tribulation were quick, quickly realizing God's not done with the Jews. God is still working upon the Jewish people. In fact, during the first three and a half years of the Tribulation, God is going to send, bring back... Elijah, we know for sure, and I believe Moses, the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, uh, Moses and Elijah were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. We know Elijah is one of them because before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the last two verses in the, book, in the Old Testament book of Malachi, it's Elijah's coming back before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I believe Moses is the other one. They call fire down from heaven. They do all these miraculous things. They stop the rain for three and a half years, just like Moses and Elijah did. And right in the middle of the three and a half, you know, three and a half years in, 
They're put to death by the Antichrist. But these two men are witnessing to the world. It says the whole world will see them when they're put to death and lying in the streets of Jerusalem. How in the world could the whole world see something happening in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? You can't. It's impossible. That's how we know it's a future thing. The whole world, and that's why we can see through satellite TV, everything else, live events taking place all over the world. So it says the whole world will watch this. The whole world will celebrate when these two men are put to death. They'll have a new Dead Prophets Day by Hallmark. You know, they're just going to be all excited because they, these two prophets of God have been put to death. They're put to death. The Antichrist goes into the temple, says, Worship me, I am God. But at the same time, there's 144,000. And I think these two witnesses lead these guys to Christ. And you have 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're like, you know, you can think of your favorite evangelist from the past. Or, you know, maybe like Greg Laurie or Billy Graham or Billy Sunday or D.L. Moody or somebody, the Apostle Paul. 144,000 of these guys running around the world proclaiming and warning and talking about Jesus to the world amazing. God's going to use them in a powerful way. As a result, the Antichrist will be furious with these Jewish believers. We know that he will stir up the wicked, and they're going to hate. They're going to persecute the Jewish people. Zechariah 13 verses 8 to 9 tells us how bad it will be for the Jews at this time, it says, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. And he's speaking to the Jews. But one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. So this one-third will make it through the great tribulation. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, This is my people. They did it to the least of these, my people. This is referring to the Jewish people. And each one will say, the Lord is my God. And so there will be many Jew, uh, Gentile sheep during the great tribulation who will help you know, the Jews. They'll step up, kind of like Tory, uh, Corrie ten Boom. Remember Corrie ten Boom and her family during World War II? Gentiles, they rescued many Jews from the Nazis. Schindler's List, maybe you saw that. I mean, he rescued many Jews from the Nazis. There were literally hundreds of Gentiles that came alongside the Jews and protected them, rescued them, hid them during that time, the darkest time in their history up to this point. Now, remember, not all the Jews will be in Israel trying to flee to Petra. There are millions of Jews scattered all over the world. There's more Jews in the United States than there are in Israel right now. And so the Lord will call them back. They'll be scattered, so they'll be protected during the Great Tribulation. By the way, uh, those of you who have gone to Israel with us, and we go to a place called Yad Vashem. It's the Holocaust Museum. It's usually one of the last days we're there. Very, very powerful place to be. Very uh, amazing scene. But there's this street outside called the Righteous Among the Nations. It's a garden. And they planted all these trees, the Jews did, for the Gentiles that rescued and protected them during the Holocaust. And the interesting thing is, um, I got to hear Corey Ten Boom speak. It was around 1980, 81 at Calvary Chapel in San Diego. She died in 1983. And so she was in California when she died. That's where she lived in the L.A. area. So she dies in 1983. And they all planted these trees in 1968, honoring those who protected the Jews during the Holocaust. Her tree, her family tree was planted there. And the day she died, her tree in Israel died. The day before, her tree was perfectly healthy. And it's interesting because... God has his eyes on the Jewish people, and he will bless those who bless his people. You know, this whole thing about replacement theology is such a slap in the face of God's word. You know, God has given them an everlasting covenant. Does it mean the Jews are righteous? Does it mean the Jews are forgiven right now? No, only in Christ are you forgiven. Only in Christ are you saved. But every nation... 
in every people group who've come against Israel, who've come against the Jewish people, God has judged, He will judge, and He'll judge our nation because there's a point coming and you can slowly see it turning this way. We're going to turn our back on the Jewish people. We're going to turn our back on Israel, and that's the final coffin in our na uh, in our final nail in our coffin for our nation when we turn our back on the Jews. I think we're hanging by a thread. Depends on who's in office, right? You know, when we were there in 2019, you know, tr you know, President Trump had moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. They were so excited about that. Now they're saying they want to move it back to Tel Aviv. I mean, they're not recognizing Jerusalem. That's God's holy city. Jesus is going to rule and reign from there. But make no mistake about it, anti-Semitism is satanic to the core. They are God's chosen people, an everlasting covenant he's given to them. But they're only saved if they come to Christ. And this is why there's so many, you know, awesome ministries, Jews for Jesus, chosen people ministries. There's, you know, Jewish groups going to Jerusalem and Israel that witness to the Jews, proclaim Jesus. So we got to keep praying for them, keep ministering to the Jews because God is not done with them. But don't ever come against the Jewish people because he will come against you sooner or later if you do. Here Jesus calls them my brethren. By the way, his brethren, from the scene we're looking at now, only a couple days later, we're going to see them in chapter 27 saying, crucify him, crucify him. They don't, even, they don't even recognize their Messiah at this point. Look at verse 41. Then he will say, also say to those on the left, to the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, um, the devil, Satan, his angels, the demons. We'll see this in Revelation 12. It says that Lucifer, he'll take a third of the angels with him in his rebellion against God. And that third of the angels that rebelled with Lucifer, that, those make up the demons. Hell, everlasting fire, the lake of fire, that was prepared for the devil and his angels. And we'll see that others will enter this place because they reject Christ. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger, or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, As surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So, a, a horrible scene here. But again, take note of that everlasting fire in verse 41. What a horrible thought that is. Everlasting fire. Again, originally prepared for Satan and his demons. When God created Lucifer, he was an angel, very powerful, very privileged. Some believe he was like the worship leader, you know, around the throne of God. What got him kicked out? We'll see in a moment. It was just simple pride. Look at this in Ezekiel 48, starting in verse 14. It says of Lucifer, You are the anointed cherub who covers. God says, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. And what was the iniquity found in him? It was pride. Just simple pride. Pride comes before a fall. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction in a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is at the root of pretty much every sin that is in this world. Pride. I'm glad we're in July because June was Pride Month. What a horrible thing. Pride Month? We're going to have a whole month of pride? Pride comes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride says, I don't need God. I can do what I want, however I want, wherever I want. 
you know what, we're just celebrating, you know, July 4th weekend, tomorrow, July 4th, Independence Day. We're not independent of God. Their Independence Day back in 1776 was all about becoming dependent on God and not being dependent on England. It was independence from England, but it was never to be independent from God. But that's where we are as a nation. We think Independence Day means I can do whatever I want. And it turns into anarchy. Be careful. The Bible warns about those who do what's right in their own eyes. Look at these verses in Isaiah 14. Again, speaking of Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart... And these are known as the five I wills. This is what Lucifer said. I will self-determination, not God's will, but I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And then God says, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. It's that last I will statement that's known as the lie of Satan. I will be like the Most High. In other words, I will be like God. That's the epitome of pride. Saying, I am going to be like God. I am going to be a God. The last summer series sessions that we're going to do, what is it, July 27, 28th, we're going to have Bill McKeever, you know, from Mormonism Research, Research Ministries here. That's the whole thing just behind Mormonism. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. I may become a God. That's what the Mormons teach. We'll see that is false. That is satanic. That is not from the Lord. That's the epitome of pride. And that is what Satan used against Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God told them, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Again, it's very simple to show when people argue about you know, free will and sovereignty of God. It's both. God is sovereign, and he created us with a free will. And we see that in the Garden of Eden. He tells Adam and Eve, hey, of all these trees, I don't know how many were there, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, all these trees you may freely eat, but this one tree, <laughs> you can't eat of that one tree. The day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. They chose poorly, right? This is what Satan does. He comes along and he says in Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5, because pride entered him. He knows, I will be just like God. That's what he's hoping for. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, contradicting God's word. But For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So that's the lie. You'll be like God. Or you don't need God, you are a God. Or you can become a God. Genesis goes on to say they bought into Satan's lie, they fell into sin, they disobeyed, they rebelled against God, and that's why we have a sinful world around us. We read about the lie, and it is the lie, not a lie. This is the lie, and it's mentioned in, in the New Testament as well. In the book of Romans, we read about the devolution of man. Wednesday night, we're talking about you know, evolution and creationism. Evolution, we're thinking we're going to get better. Devolution is what Romans 1 is all about. We're not getting better. We're devolving. We're going down away from the Lord, and we rebel against His Word. We reject His truth. It comes in the form of humanism, evolution, worship of nature, worshiping any created thing. Because of this downward spiral against the Lord, this is what Paul says, Romans 1, starting in verse 24. I encourage you to read Romans 1, 18 through 32. That covers the whole gist of it. It says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their heart, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for, notice, the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever, Amen. And so worshiping, serving the creature, simply self-worship, glorifying yourself, doing your own thing, even though it's nothing but selfish, foolish pride. 
The culmination of all this will be on full display during the Great Tribulation. This is when God gives people over to the lie during the Great Tribulation. Look at this in 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 9. It says, The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. In Revelation 13 it says, Satan gives the Antichrist all of his power and his authority. So he's going to be doing all these lying signs and wonders. With all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive, again, the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe, again, the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so these are the goats that Jesus is referring to here in Matthew 25 when he says, Depart from me, you cursed. Why are they cursed? Because they totally disregarded God's plan for the Jewish people. They came against the Jewish people. They were, the Jews were under tremendous persecution during the reign of the Antichrist. In fact, these are, these are the people we read about numerous times in the book of Revelation where they're shaking their fists at God. They're cursing the name of God. They're blaspheming the name of God. And, and this here's an example in Revelation 16, verse 11. It says, They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. That's the bottom line. They reject God's plan, even though he's given them two witnesses, 144,000 witnesses. He'll even send an angel in Revelation 14, 6. It says he has the everlasting gospel to preach to the entire world. And yet these are the ones that will shake their fists and say, I'm not going to repent, and they will be destroyed. This is what it says in verse 46, the last verse. And these will go away. These are the goats. They'll go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is a true statement for all human beings. This is a true statement for every person who has ever lived. The unsaved will go into everlasting punishment. Those who put their faith and trust in Christ alone, the righteous, those who believe God's word, Old Testament saints, we will go into eternal life. So everlasting punishment, eternal life. Everlasting, eternal. The Greek word is the exact same. It's aionios. Aionios. It just means perpetual, never-ending, forever and ever. With God, it's either eternal life or it's eternal punishment. It doesn't matter how many people or even theologians try and argue that hell or the lake of fire is not eternal. God's word is clear on this. There, there's no debating this. You either have eternal life or you don't. I, I can't, but I wish I could say, receive, well, I can say it, but receive Jesus and you'll receive eternal life. I can't make anybody do that. I can just plead with people, surrender to the Lord. He has eternal life. It's a free gift that he will give to anyone. Jesus is both the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world every Christmas. Oh, we love the little baby in the manger, the little lamb. Oh, he's so sweet and cuddly. But he's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he comes back, he's going to judge. So don't just put him in one compartment. He is the sacrificial Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, but he's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But he loves you. He paid the price for your sins. And he is coming back to rule and reign over this world. Let me close with these verses in John 5, 22. This is Jesus speaking. He says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Important verse here. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. You know, people will say, and I've had them say, oh, God's great, but I'm not so sure about this Jesus guy. Or they'll say, oh, Jesus, I like him, but that God up there, I don't know, I can handle that guy. No, if you don't honor the Son, you don't honor the Father. If you don't honor the Father, you don't honor the Son. He sent the Son. Co-equal, co-eternal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
It's time to get right with the Lord before he comes for his bride. Otherwise, you'll be going into the great tribulation. And that is brutal beyond anybody's comprehension.